Section 25 of Lives of the Ancient Philosophers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Ancient Philosophers by Francois Fenelon. Diogenes, Part 2 an infamous eunuch having caused it to be written on the door of his own house nothing bad enters here diogenes exclaimed then which way does the master of the house enter some philosophers wishing to prove to him that there was no such thing as motion diogenes got up and began to walk about what are you doing asked one of the philosophers refuting your arguments replied he when some one spoke to him of astrology he asked him if it was long since he returned from the sky plato having defined man to be a two-legged animal without feathers diogenes plucked a cock and hiding it under his cloak took it with him to the academy then drawing the bird from under his cloak and throwing it in the midst of the assembly he exclaimed behold the man of plato plato was obliged to add to his definition that this animal had long nails as diogenes was passing through megara he observed that many of the children were quite naked but that all the sheep were well covered with wool it is much better said he to be a sheep here than a child one day when he was eating he saw some little mice picking up the crumbs under the table. Ah, cried he, Diogenes nourishes parasites as well as other people do. Coming one day out of the bath, he was asked if there were many men there. He answered, No. But, said they, is there not a great number of people? Yes, replied he, a great number of beings of some sort. He was entreated to go to a festival, but he would not, because he had been at one the day before, and had not been thanked for his company. A man carrying a piece of timber inadvertently ran against him, and then called out, Take care! What? said Diogenes, are you going to strike me again? Some time afterwards, meeting with a similar adventure, he gave a blow of his stick, to the person who ran against him and said take care yourself he was one day so soaked with rain that the water dropped from every part of his cloak those who saw him expressed great compassion for his uncomfortable situation but plato who passed by chance said to them if you wish him to be truly unhappy you need only go away and not look at him a man having one day given him a box on his ear i did not know said he that i ought to walk in the streets with my head armed another time being asked what he would take for a box on his ear a helmet replied he midas one day gave him several blows with his fist saying to him go and lament you shall have three hundred pounds to make you amends the next day diogenes took an iron gauntlet and gave midas a violent blow on the head with it saying now go yourself and complain you shall have the same amends you promised me lysias the apothecary asked him if he believed in gods how can i not believe in them answered he since i know that they have no other enemies than such as yourself seeing a man washing in hopes of purifying himself unfortunate man said he do you not know that were you to wash till to-morrow that would neither prevent you from making faults in grammar nor cleanse you from your crimes seeing a child in an indecent posture he ran to his preceptor and striking him with his stick asked him why he did not instruct his pupil better a man showed him one day a horoscope he had been making it is something very fine said diogenes but will it prevent us from dying of hunger 
he blamed those who complained of fortune men said he are always asking for what appears good but never for that which is really so diogenes was very well aware that many approved his life but as few tried to imitate him he said he was a dog much esteemed but none of those who praised him had courage enough to follow the chase with him he reproached those who were terrified at their dreams with not paying any attention to their thoughts whilst awake and examining with superstition all that passed in their imaginations whilst asleep one day as he was walking he saw a woman in a litter and said so wicked an animal ought not to have such a cage the athenians loved and respected diogenes they caused a young man to be publicly whipped for breaking his tub and gave him another hearing everybody extol the happiness of callisthenes who was every day at the table of alexander as for me said diogenes i think callisthenes very unfortunate if it be for nothing but having to dine and sup every day with alexander crates did everything he could to attract him to his court but diogenes told him he had much rather eat only dry bread at athens than live sumptuously in his palace perdicas carried his desire for his society so far that he even threatened to kill him if he would not come and see him you will not achieve any great action in doing that replied diogenes the least little venomous animal could do the same thing and i can assure you diogenes wants neither perdicas nor his grandeur to enable him to live happily alas cried he once the gods are very liberal to grant life to man but all the pleasures attached to it remain unknown to those who only think of good eating and perfuming themselves observing a man having his shoes put on by a slave you will not be content said he till he wipes your nose of what use are your hands another time seeing judges taking away to punishment a man who had stolen a small sum from the public treasury those are great thieves leading a little one said he he compared an ignorant rich man to a sheep covered with a golden fleece one day he began to scratch himself in the middle of the market would to the gods cried he that by scratching myself i could satisfy my hunger when i choose going into a bath he saw a young man making very skilful but not very modest movements the better you do said he the more blamable you are another time walking through a street he saw an advertisement on the house of a prodigal which showed it was to be sold i knew said he that excessive drunkenness would oblige your master to vomit one day a man reproached him with his exile ah poor unfortunate man said diogenes to him i am glad of it it is that which has made me a philosopher another said a short time afterwards the sinopians have condemned you to perpetual banishment and i replied he condemned them to remain in their own horrid country on the shores of the pontus euxinus he often prayed to statues when asked the reason he replied that it was to accustom himself to be refused when his poverty obliged him to beg he said to the first he met if thou hast ever given anything do me the same favour and if thou hast never bestowed anything before begin with me when asked how dionysius treated his friends as we do bottles said he which we take care of when full and throw away when empty observing a spendthrift in an inn who only ate olives he said to him if you had always dined thus you would not now sup so badly he used to say 
that unruly desires were the sources of all the misfortunes that attend the human species that virtuous men were like the gods that the belly was the gulf of life that a polite discourse was a thread of honey and that love was only the occupation of idlers he was one day asked which was the most unfortunate state that of being alone old and poor answered he liberty he valued as the best thing in the world when asked what beast bit hardest amongst wild beasts said he a slanderer and amongst tame a flatterer he saw one day some women hanging from olive branches ah would to the gods cried he that all trees bore the same fruits a man asking him what was the proper age to marry when young replied diogenes it is too soon and when old too late when asked why gold was such a pale color it is because it is so closely allied to envy said he being pressed to send after his slave manes who had fled he said it would be very ridiculous that if manes can do without diogenes diogenes could not do without manes a certain tyrant having asked him what marble was the most proper to make a statue with he replied that with which those of harmodius and aristogiton the great enemies of tyrants are made one day plato explained his ideas and spoke of the form of a table and a glass i see very plainly a table and a glass said diogenes but i do not know the form of either that is very likely said plato for to see them you need only have eyes but to know the form of them you must have sense diogenes being asked what he thought of socrates said he was a fool seeing a young man blush courage my child said he that is the color of virtue two lawyers chose him for their arbiter he condemned them both one because he had stolen what he had been accused of the other because he complained of wrong when he had lost nothing that he would not have stolen from another he was one day asked why more money was given to cripples than to philosophers it is replied he because those who give to them expect to become cripples sooner than philosophers somebody asked him if he had no servant no replied diogenes then who will bury you asked the other he who wants my house replied diogenes a certain man reproached him for having formerly coined base money it is true replied diogenes that i was once what you now are but you will never be what i am he went one day into the school of a certain master who had only very few scholars but was surrounded with statues of the muses and the graces and other divinities you have a large party of disciples here said diogenes if we reckon their godships in the number being asked what country he belonged to he replied that he was a citizen of the world meaning that philosophers ought not to be attached to any country in particular happening to meet a spendthrift one day he asked him for a mina how said the spendthrift do you only ask an obelisk of others and a mina of me i do replied diogenes for this reason others may give me something more another time but i doubt much whether you will ever again have the ability to do so being asked if death were to be deemed an evil how can it be so he replied when we are not even sensible of it when it happens diogenes saw once an awkward person who was going to shoot at a target he ran instantly and put his head before the mark he was asked why he did so it is for fear he should hit me he replied when diogenes was told that most persons ridiculed him what does it signify answered he if i know myself to be laughed at and perhaps asses mock them 
when they grin and show their teeth as if they were laughing. But, said they, people do not care for asses. And I, answered he, care as little for those people. He was asked why he was called dog. It is, said he, because I fawn upon those that give to me, that I bark at those that give me nothing, and that I bite the wicked. Another time he was asked what kind of dog he was. When I am hungry, said he, I am of the greyhound kind. I caress everybody, but when I am full, I savor of the mastiff, and bite all I meet. He saw one day Anaximenes, the rhetorician, who was very corpulent. Give me a little of your corpulency, said he. You will do me a great pleasure, and at the same time will free yourself of a heavy encumbrance. When he was reproached for eating in the streets and the markets, it is, said he, that hunger seizes me in those places as well as everywhere else. As he returned from Lacedaemonia to Athens, he was asked whence he came. I come from men, answered he, but I return to women. He often compared handsome courtesans to excellent wine mixed with poison. He used to call them the queens of kings because they obtained from them all they wished. A certain man was admiring the great quantity of presents that was in a temple of Samothracia. There would be many more, said Diogenes, if all those that have perished had made offerings, instead of all those that have saved themselves. One day, as he was eating in the middle of a street, several people assembled themselves around him, calling him a dog. It is you that are dogs, said he, for you surround a man merely because he is eating. A miserable wrestler, who was starving in his profession, bethought himself at last of turning physician. Diogenes met him and said, You have now a fine opportunity of revenging yourself on those that have beaten you formerly. As he was walking one day, he perceived the son of a courtesan throwing stones in the middle of a crowd. My child, said he, take care that you do not hit your father. A man asked him once for a cloak which he had that belonged to him. If you have given it me, said Diogenes, it is mine by right, and if you have only lent it me, I am now using it. Wait till I have done with it. When he was reproached for drinking in public houses, he used to answer, If I want shaving, am I not to go to a barber's shop? He heard one day that a man was praised for having given him alms. It is I that ought to be praised, said Diogenes, for having merited them. When he was asked what profit he had derived from his philosophy, he replied, If it has only enabled me to suffer all the evil that may happen to me, I should have reason to be satisfied. When he heard that the Athenians had declared Alexander to be Bacchus, he said to him, laughing, Why do you not make me Serapis? He was reproved for lodging in dirty places. The sun, said he, shows itself in places that are a great deal more dirty, yet they do not spoil his beams. A certain man said to him, how can you, who know nothing, be so bold as to rank yourself with the philosophers? Even though I had no other merit, he answered, than that of imitating the philosopher, that would suffice to prove me one. One day a young man was introduced to him in order to become his disciple. His friends said all the good of him imaginable, that he was wise, strictly moral and abundantly well informed. Diogenes listened very patiently to all that was said. As he is so accomplished, answered he, he does not want me. Why then do you bring him to me? Entering the theater once, as everybody was leaving it, he was asked his reason for so doing. 
He said it was what he had resolved to do all his life. Dionysius, the tyrant, after having been dethroned, returned to Corinth, where poverty obliged him to teach youth to prevent himself from starving. Diogenes, hearing the children screaming, went one day into his school. Dionysius thought that Diogenes was come to console him in his misery. Diogenes, said he, I thank you. Alas, you see in me an example of the inconstancy of fortune. Wretch, answered Diogenes, I am surprised to see you still alive, you who have done so much harm in your kingdom, and I plainly see that you are not a better schoolmaster than you were a king. Observing some women who were propitiating the gods in order that they might have sons, you think more about having sons, said he to them, than that they may prove honest men. Hearing a young man of highly prepossessing appearance make use of indecent expressions, are you not ashamed, said he, to draw a sword of lead from an ivory sheath? He used to say that those people who exalted virtue, yet never practiced it, were like musical instruments, which produced sweet sounds without having any sentiment. A man said to him one day, I am not fit for philosophy. Why do you live then, miserable wretch, said he, since you despair of ever being able to live as you ought? Another time, he perceived a young man doing something very improper. Are you not ashamed, said he, thus to abase the manhood which nature gives you? He used to say that almost everyone lived in servitude, that slaves obeyed their masters, and the masters their passions, that everything consisted in custom, that a person accustomed to live delightfully in luxury and in pleasures could never withdraw himself from it, and that, on the contrary, to despise a luxurious life was a real pleasure to those who were accustomed to live in a different way. To such a height did he carry his cynicism that he considered modesty as a weakness, and he was not ashamed to do the most indecent things in public. If supping be a good thing, he used to say, why not sup as well in the middle of a market as in a room? He was asked where he would like to be buried when he died. In the open plain, said he. How, answered someone, do you not fear to serve as food for birds of prey and ferocious animals? A stick must be placed near me, said Diogenes, so that I may drive them away when they approach. But, said they, you will not be sensible of it. Well, then, what will it signify if they devour me, answered Diogenes, as I shall not feel it? Some say that at ninety years of age, he ate a neat's foot raw, which caused so great an indigestion that he died of it. Others say that, finding himself growing old, he held his breath, and in that manner caused his own death by voluntary suffocation. His friends came the next day and found him enveloped in his cloak. They uncovered him, thinking he was not asleep, for he never slept very soundly, but they found that he was dead. They disputed amongst themselves who was to bury him, and were very near coming to blows about it, but the magistrates and elders of Corinth arrived in time and appeased them. Diogenes was interred near the gate which led towards the isthmus. Near his tomb they erected a monument, on which they placed a dog of Parian marble. The death of this philosopher happened the same day that Alexander died at Babylon in the 114th Olympiad. Diogenes was honored with several statues, erected to him by private persons after his death with appropriate inscriptions. End of section 25. Recording by Linda Johnson. Section 26 of Lives of the Ancient Philosophers. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings on the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Ancient Philosophers by Francois Fenelon. Crates, contemporary with Polemo, the successor of Xenocrates in the school of Plato, flourished about the 113th Olympiad. One of the most famous disciples of the celebrated Diogenes was Crates, the son of Ascondus, a Theban. His family was very wealthy and highly respectable. Being present one day at the performance of a tragedy in which Telephus, one of the principal characters, abandons all his possessions in order to embrace the Cynic philosophy, he was so struck by the example that he instantly resolved to imitate it, and accordingly sold all his patrimony for which he received above two hundred talents. This sum he placed in the hands of a banker for the future benefit of his children, should they happen only to have capacities of the ordinary level. But should they, on the contrary, possess sufficient elevation of mind to rank themselves with philosophers, he intended the money to be distributed among the citizens of Thebes as an article which philosophers did not require. His friends went to him to entreat him not to persevere, in his determination, but he drove them out of his house, and even ran after them some way with a stick. In the summer, Crates wore a thick cloak. In the depth of winter, on the contrary, he was always lightly clad, in order that he might accustom himself to the changes and varieties of the season, without being inconvenienced by them. He boldly entered the residence of all sorts of persons, if he wished to reprimand them for anything in which he had displeased him. He used to run after people of dissolute conduct, and pour out a torrent of abuse on them, in hopes of drawing it out upon himself in return intending by so doing to render calumny and injustice habitually easy for him to bear like the rest of the cynics he lived austerely and drank nothing but water the orator metrocles had ceased to speak in public on account of being tormented with flatulency which he could not help betraying in certain audible sounds which often covered him with confusion in the middle of his harangues this circumference, simple enough in itself, chagrined him so greatly that he confined himself entirely at home, resolving to pass the remainder of his life in all the forlornness of solitude. Crates heard his situation mentioned, and immediately devouring a great quantity of lupin, in order to fill himself with wind, he went directly afterwards to the house of Metrocles. He entered into conversation with him, and made a number of excellent observations in order to prove to him that where there was no guilt, there ought be no shame that the inconveniences of which he complained were common to all the world. Besides, and I should not be at all surprised, added he, if I were to show you that I am no way exempt from them myself. While he spoke the lupins began to produce the effect he wished. He seemed not in the least disconcerted at it, and Metricles, taking courage from such a good example, and feeling that he annexed too much importance to the cause that had driven him out of society, burst through all the restraints of ceremony, burned the writings of Theophrastus, under whom he had studied, and attached himself ever afterwards to Crates, who soon made him an excellent cynic. In the course of time, Metricles himself became a celebrated teacher of the cynic philosophy, and had many disciples of eminence. But as he advanced in years, disgusted with the infirmities of age, he became weary of his existence, and put a violent end to it by strangling himself. Crates was ugly by nature, and, to render his appearance still more remarkable and hideous, he covered his cloak with sheepskins, so that it was difficult to say at first sight to what species of animal he belonged. He was likewise very agile in all kinds of exercises, and when he went into public to join in wrestling and other sports of that kind, the singularity of his figure and habits always excited laughter. This, however, never gave him the smallest vexation. He used only to lift up his hands and exclaim, Patience, Crates, those who laugh at you now, will soon find it in their turn to weep, and you will have the pleasure of seeing them envy your enjoyments, and lament their own imbecility. He went one day to ask a favor of a master, for one of his scholars, but instead of enforcing his request in the usual manner, by embracing the master's knees, he embraced his thighs. This appeared very extraordinary to the master, who evinced great displeasure at it. "'Why should you be offended?' asked Crates. "'Do not your thighs belong to you as much as your knees?' He used to say that it was impossible to find any human being without fault, but that a few rotten grains did not spoil a fine pomegranate. Crates wished his disciples to be entirely disencumbered from worldly possessions. My learning is my own wealth, he used to say, 
Everything else I have freely resigned to those who delight in luxury and show. He exhorted his followers to avoid sensual pleasures above all things, because a philosopher ought to think liberty more desirable than any other enjoyment, and voluptuousness was the most tyrannical of all masters. Hunger, said he, gets the better of love, or if that be not sufficiently powerful, time will do the rest. And at any rate, one may always find a cord, and settle the matter by hanging himself. Whenever he began to disclaim against the corrupt manners of his own time, he always launched into the bitterest censors of the folly of mankind, who willingly incurred any expense for things of which they ought to be ashamed, provided they were connected with the gratification of the passions, and yet grudged the smallest cost for anything laudable or profitable. It was Crates who formed the scale of rewards, which has since been so often repeated, to a cook, ten minae, to a physician, a drachma, to a flatterer and a castle-builder, five talents, to a courtesan, a talent, and to a philosopher, an obulus. Being asked what he had learned by this philosophy, he replied, to be contented with vegetables and to live without care or uneasiness. One day, Demetrius Valerius sent him some wine and bread. Crates, indignant at the thought that a philosopher should require wine, sent it back, saying with an air of displeasure, would to heaven we could be supplied with bread also, by fountains, as we are with water. The freedom of manners, which Crates assumed towards every one, so charmed Hipparchia, the sister of Metrocles, that she refused the most advantageous matches on his account, and even went so far as to threaten her parents that she would kill herself if they did not suffer her to marry him. In vain they endeavoured by every argument in their power to make her change her resolution, and they were forced to have recourse to Crates himself, entreating him to use his influence over her, to divert her from her design. He was not more successful, however, than they had been. At least he rose from his seat, and stripped himself in her presence, in order that she might see his humpback and crooked body, then throwing his staff and wallet upon the ground beside the cloak. Now, said he, that you may not be deceived in your choice of a husband, take notice, that you see me as I am, and all my possessions. Consider well what you mean to do, for, if you marry me, I have nothing better to offer you. Hipparchia did not hesitate a moment, but instantly determined to secure Crates at the expense of all she possessed at that time, and all she might hope for at that future period. She never forsook her husband, but went everywhere with him, even into the most crowded meetings. One day, being at an entertainment at the house of Lysimachus, she sported the sophism with Theodorus, the impious, who was also one of the guests. If Theodorus do an act for which he is not blamed, neither ought Hipparchia do the same act to be blamed. Theodorus, in striking himself, commits an action which no one has any right to blame him for. Therefore, Hipparchia, in striking Theodorus, enforcing her argument with a slap in the face, does not commit an action that any one has a right to blame her for. Theodorus did not make a direct reply to this logic, but pulling her cloak aside, he called out, Look, here is a woman who has left her needle and thread. True, replied Hipparchia, but you surely will not condemn me for preferring philosophy to such feminine occupations. From this well-sorted marriage of Crates and Hipparchia sprang a son named Poseides, who was educated with great care by both his father and mother in the principles of the cynic philosophy. Alexander one day asked Crates if he would like to see his native city rebuilt. There would be no use in it, he replied, for most likely some other Alexander would come and destroy it again. He used to say that he had no other country than poverty and contempt of grandeur, and that he was a citizen of Phogenes, and consequently exempt from every species of envy. He compared the wealth of the great to trees which sprung up on the mountains and inaccessible rocks, and only serve to nourish kites and ravens. In the same manner that the great lavish their riches only on flatterers and women of loose habits. In fact, he said, a rich man was only a calf surrounded by wolves. Being asked what length of time it might be necessary to study philosophy, he replied, Until you have learned that generals of armies are much the same sort of persons with drivers of asses. Crates, like the rest of the cynics, devoted himself entirely to the study of ethics, paying no attention to any of the other sciences. 
Towards the close of his life he was bent almost double with the burden of his years. Perceiving his end approaching, he said, as he surveyed himself, Ah, poor humpback, thy load of years is now bringing thee to the grave, that wilt soon see the palace of Pluto. Thus weakness and old age at length terminated his existence. The time when his reputation was at its zenith was about the 113th Olympiad. It was during this period that he flourished at Thebes, and surpassed all the cynics of that time. He was the master of Zeno, the founder of the celebrated sect of Stoics. End of section 26「Section 27 of Lives of the Ancient Philosophers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Ancient Philosophers by Francois Fanelon. Section 27. Firo. Firo lived about the time of Epicurus, towards the end of the 120th Olympiad. Firo established the sect called Firinists, or Skeptics. He was the son of Plistarchus, of the city of Elia in the Peloponnesus. He first studied the art of painting, then he was a disciple of Draso, and afterwards of the philosopher Anarchus, to whom he attached himself so much that he followed him even to India. Firo, during this long journey, conversed particularly with the Magi, the Gymnosophists, and all the Eastern philosophers. After instructing himself as to the source of all their opinions, he found nothing which could satisfy him. It appeared to him that all things were incomprehensible, that truth was concealed in the depth of an abyss, and that there was nothing more reasonable than to doubt everything, and never to decide. He maintained that all men regulated their lives from certain received opinions, that each one acted but from habit, that they examined passing events agreeably to the laws and customs established in each country, but that they knew not whether these laws were in themselves good or bad in the beginning of his career firo was unknown he exercised his art as a painter and they preserved for a long time at elia several of his works in which he had best succeeded his life was very solitary and he never returned into society he often took long journeys and never told anybody where he intended going he suffered much and complained of nothing he trusted so little to the guidance of his senses that he never left the path he was pursuing either for rocks or precipices or any other peril it appeared that he preferred the chance of danger rather than the trouble of avoiding a chariot some of his friends therefore always followed him and took care to warn him of his situation on such occasions he possessed an equal temper and habited himself at all times in the same fashion when he conversed and the person to whom he spoke for any reason withdrew and left him alone he yet continued his discourse till he had finished it just as if he was still listened to he treated everybody with the same indifference the reputation of firo extended itself in a short time throughout greece and a number of people embraced his doctrine those of elia after having convinced themselves of his merit had so much veneration for him that they created him sovereign pontiff of their religion everybody regarded him as a man truly just free of all kinds of discontent vanity and superstition indeed the philosopher simon assures us that he was regarded as a minor deity upon earth he passed his life tranquilly with his sister philista who professed herself a sage he went to market to sell his own poultry and pigs and he cleaned his house himself a dog one day attempted to bite him firo repulsed him some one reminded him that this did not accord with his principles ah answered he it is indeed difficult to divest oneself of prejudices and it requires the greatest perseverance to become superior to the generality of men 
to this end every exertion should be made and to effect it the force of all our reasoning must be employed another time he was sailing in a small bark the wind suddenly threatened a storm the vessel was in danger of perishing all those who had accompanied Firo were in a state of the greatest apprehension Firo remained perfectly tranquil amid the tempest he drew the attention of his companions to a little pig which continued eating near them as contentedly as if the vessel had been in port and remarked to them that wise men should endeavour to imitate the example of this little animal in order to be calm under all circumstances Firo was troubled with an ulcer the person who dressed it was one day obliged to perform on it a most painful operation by cutting it and applying caustic to the part affected Firo never allowed that he suffered the least pain nor did his countenance betray any this philosopher believed that the highest degree of perfection which could be attained in this world was to abstain from deciding on any subject his disciples all agreed in this respect they never advanced a positive opinion one party among them however sought truth hoping to discover it and others despaired of ever succeeding in the search some believed that they might affirm one thing which was that they certainly knew nothing whilst others would scarcely venture even to make that assertion some of these opinions were entertained before Firo existed but as no one had till that time professed absolutely to doubt all things to him these sceptical principles have been entirely ascribed the reason which induced this philosopher in all cases to suspend his judgment was the conviction that we know nothing except by the relation which one thing bears to another and that we are ignorant ourselves of what they really are the leaves of the willow for example are sweet to goats and bitter to men hemlock is nutritious to quails and occasions death in men dimophon the purveyor of alexander felt in the shade the same heat that others experience in the sun the rays of which seemed only to chill him and on of argus traversed the sands of libya without thirst that which is just in one country is in another the reverse as that which is virtue amongst certain nations is in others vice in persia fathers marry their daughters and with the greeks this is a shameful crime the massagate do not require constancy in the married state with other nations such an opinion is repulsive theft is a merit among the Cilicians, and the greeks make it punishable aristippus has a certain idea of pleasure antisthenes another epicurus a distinct one from either some believe in the providence of god others deny it the egyptians bury their dead the indians burn them and the paconians throw them into rivers that which appears to have one certain colour from the light of the sun derives another from the reflection of the moon and still another from the candle the neck of a pigeon according to the different sides on which we examine it seems to have a variety of colours wine taken moderately supplies temporary strength when drunk in large quantities it impairs the senses and deprives the mind of its powers that which is to the right of one person is to the left of another greece which with regard to italy is to the east is west with regard to persia that which in some places is considered a miracle is in others a common occurrence the same man is to some persons a father and to others a brother in short the contradiction which they met with in everything rendered Firo and his disciples incompetent to define anything because they believed that there was nothing in the world which was absolutely known to us by itself they required in everything a comparison which proved a relation to some other thing previously existing as they acknowledged no certain truth they of necessity banished all sorts of demonstrations for said they all demonstration ought to be derived from something clear and evident and which requires no proof 
there is nothing in the world which can be of this nature since should things appear evident to us we should be obliged to prove the truth of the reasoning which makes us converts to this belief Fero, like homer compared man to the leaves of trees which perpetually succeed each other and are constantly replaced by new ones whilst he lived he was regarded with the greatest veneration and he died after having attained his ninetieth year End of section twenty seven section twenty eight of the lives of the ancient philosophers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lives of the ancient philosophers by francois fenelon bion bion was a disciple of theophrastus who succeeded aristotle in the peripatetic school towards the one hundred and fourteenth olympiad the philosopher bion studied a long time in the academy this school displeased him he ridiculed the laws they observed there and made them every day subjects of raillery at last he quitted it entirely he took a cloak a staff and a bag and embraced the cynic doctrine though even to that he made some objections and modulated it by adapting it with many of the precepts of theodorus the disciple and successor of aristippus of the cyreniac school finally he studied under theophrastus who succeeded aristotle bion possessed a fine understanding and was a very good logician he excelled in poetry and music and had a particular genius for mathematics he indulged himself in his manner of living and passed his life in dissipation he never remained long in any place he walked from town to town and was to be found at all festivals where his great talents amused the company and could not fail to ensure him their admiration as he was very agreeable everybody received and entertained him with pleasure Bion heard one day that some of his enemies had spoken of him to the king Antigonus, ridiculing the meanness of his origin. He did not seem offended and affected to be ignorant of having discovered it. Antigonus sent for Bion, anticipating that he would be much distressed. He said to him, Tell me in a few words thy name, thy country, thy origin, and of what profession were thy parents. Bion, with the greatest coolness, replied, my father was a free man who sold lard and salt butter it was impossible to guess whether he had been formerly handsome or ugly his face was so disfigured by the blows it had received from his master he was born on the banks of the borysenes and was consequently a scythian he became acquainted with my mother in some place of public resort where they met and there they celebrated their marriage i know not what crimes my father committed but he was sold with his wife and children i was an engaging boy an orator bought me and when he died left me all he was possessed of i immediately tore his will which i threw into the fire i proceeded to athens where i made philosophy my study you are now acquainted with my name my country my father and my whole history at least as much as i know of it myself perseus and philander in pretending to know more would only have been seeking to amuse you at my expense bion was one day asked what men might be considered the most unhappy those replied he who wish most passionately to be happy and to live in a state of perfect exemption from care he said that old age was the acme of all miseries that all misfortunes reserved themselves for this period that no one ought to count the number of his years but in proportion to the glory which he may have acquired during the course of them in the world that beauty was a blessing that did not depend on ourselves and that riches were the excitement of all great enterprises because without them nothing can be accomplished whatever ability we may have for other pursuits he one day met a man who had squandered away his wealth he said to him the earth swallowed imperius but as for thee thou hast swallowed the earth a talkative and very importune man mentioned to him that he designed to ask him a favour i will do willingly what you wish me replied bion provided that you send me some one to tell me what you want so that you do not come yourself another time he put to sea in a vessel accompanied by men of bad character 
they were taken by pirates these villains said one to the other should they recognize us we are undone and for myself said bion i am lost if they do not know me he saw one day coming towards him a certain envious person who appeared very unhappy has any misfortune befallen you said he to him or has any good befallen any other person when he saw a miser passing he said to him thou possessest not thy goods it is thy good things which possess thee he said that misers hoarded their wealth as if it was for their own use only and that they feared to avail themselves of it as much as if it belonged to others he deemed it one of the greatest miseries not to be able to endure misfortune he said that no one ought to be reproached with old age since it is the state at which every one wishes to arrive that it is better to give away our own riches than to wish for those of others because it is impossible to be happy with a small portion of them and to wish for what we have not always brings unhappiness that sometimes rashness is not unbecoming in a young man but that old men should always consult prudence that when we have gained friends they should always be retained whatever they may be lest it should appear that we have associated with wicked men or that we have neglected good ones he advised his friends to believe that they had made some progress in philosophy when they yielded neither to painful or pleasurable sensations whether they received injuries or listened to compliments paid them he said that evil deeds were bad companions for conscience since it was very difficult for a man to speak boldly when his conscience reproached him with anything and when he believed that a divine being was justly irritated against him that the road to eternal misery must be very easy since it might be pursued with our eyes shut that those who could not philosophize and who attached themselves to the improvement of general science were like the lovers of penelope who contented themselves with the society of the servants of the house being unable to obtain that of their mistress when bion was at rhodes he remarked that all the athenians who were in that island applied themselves entirely to the cultivation of eloquence and declamation he began to teach philosophy some one blamed him because he would not come into the pursuits of those around him i have imported wheat replied bion do you advise me to sell barley when they spoke to him of the Danaides, who perpetually drew water in tubs pierced with holes he said i should consider them much more pitiable if they were obliged to draw it in vases which had no hole in it after having led an abandoned life bion fell ill at chalcis where he languished for a long time as he was very poor and had not any money to pay for the attendance of servants in order to take proper care of him king antigonus sent him two slaves and presented him with a chariot in order that he might go out when he wished it is said that bion during his illness repented of having despised the gods and he had recourse to them to afford him consolation in this pitiable situation he made the altar smoke with the savour of his sacrifices he confessed his crimes and had the weakness to implore the assistance of an old sorceress to whose arts he abandoned himself he uncovered his arms and his neck in order that she might fasten her spells to them he admitted the most extraordinary superstitions he ornamented his door with laurels and was willing to submit to anything to preserve life but all these remedies proved useless and the unhappy bion died at last a victim to the diseases his past dissipations had brought upon him End of section twenty eight section twenty nine of lives of the ancient philosophers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org Lives of the Ancient Philosophers by Francois Fenelon, Epicurus, Part 1. Epicurus, born the third year of the 109th Olympiad, died the second of the 127th, aged 72 years. Epicurus, of the family of the Philaides, was born at Athens toward the 109th Olympiad. From the age of 14, he applied himself to the study of philosophy. He studied some time at Samos under Pamphilus, the Platonist, but he never admired his doctrines. 
He therefore withdrew himself from his school and did not attach himself to any other master. It is said that he taught grammar, but in a short time he became disgusted with this also. He read with much pleasure the works of Democritus, which assisted him in composing the system he afterwards formed. At the age of 32, he taught philosophy at Mytilene and then at Lampascus. After five years, he returned to Athens, where he instituted a new sect. He purchased a beautiful garden, which he cultivated himself. It was there he established his school and led a calm and quiet life with his disciples, whom he instructed whilst they were walking and at work. And he made them repeat by heart the precepts which he gave them. People came from all parts of Greece to have the pleasure of conversing with him and contemplating him in his solitude. Epicurus possessed a great sincerity and candor of disposition. He was mild and affable to everybody, and had so affectionate and strong a feeling for his relations and for his friends that he consulted only their happiness and devoted all he possessed to them. He expressly commanded his disciples to have compassion for their slaves. He treated his own with peculiar humanity. He allowed them to study and took the trouble to instruct them himself along with his own disciples. Epicurus never took any other nourishment than bread and water or the fruit and vegetables which grew in his garden. He said sometimes to his attendants, bring me a little milk and cheese in order that I may have a treat. Such, says Laertius, was the life of him who had been represented as a voluptuary. Cicero, in his Tusculan questions, exclaims, ah, with how little Epicurus contended himself. The disciples of Epicurus imitated the frugality and other virtues of their master. They, like himself, lived on fruit and vegetables. Some took occasionally a little wine, but others never drank anything but water. Epicurus did not wish them to have a common purse, like the disciples of Pythagoras, because, said he, it is rather a mark of distrust amongst themselves than of a perfect union. He believed there was nothing more noble than the study of philosophy, that young men could not begin it too soon, and that old ones ought never to relinquish it since the object of it was to live a happy life, consequently everybody must be anxious to embrace it. The felicity spoken of by philosophers he maintained to be a natural one, that is to say, a state of happiness at which it is possible to arrive in this life by employing a reason with which nature has gifted us. Epicurus thought it consisted not in sensual pleasure, but in tranquility of mind and bodily health. He had no other idea of supreme good than possessing these two blessings at the same time. He reasoned that virtue is the most powerful means of rendering life happy because there is nothing more desirable than to live wisely and according to the rules of honesty, to have in oneself no cause of reproach, to be guilty of no crime, to injure nobody, to do as much good as it is possible, and, in short, not to fail in any of the duties of life. He infers from this that only the good can be happy, and that virtue is inseparable from tranquility. He was never tired of praising sobriety and continence, which powerfully tended to preserve in the mind a settled calm, to ensure bodily health, and even to repair it when it has been once weakened. We ought, said he, to accustom ourselves to be satisfied with a little. It is the greatest wealth that can ever be acquired. The most common foods affords as much pleasure when there is absolute hunger as the most delicious meats. People are always better when they live simply. The head is never disordered, the mind is free, and there is then always a capability to search after truth and to consider the reason by which we are induced to prefer one action to another. He showed, in short, that recreations which are occasionally enjoyed are much more relished and the reverses of fortune much more easily endured by persons who know how to be contented with the little that nature requires than by those who are accustomed to live luxuriously and magnificently. We cannot, he would add, too carefully avoid that kind of debauchery which pollutes the body and brutifies the mind. However desirable pleasure may appear in itself, we ought to fly from it when the evils in its train exceed the satisfaction which results from it. And in the same manner, it is better to suffer anything unpleasant if it be sure to be recompensed by a good yet more considerable. He maintained, in opposition to the cynics, 
that indolence was positive pleasure and that the pleasures of the mind were much more actual than those of the body. For, said he, the body feels only the present pain or pleasure, whereas the mind feels also the past and the future. He believed that the soul is corporal because it acts upon the body and participates in all its joys and sorrows, wakes us in an instant from a sound sleep, and even makes us change color according to its own varying emotions. He holds that unless the soul were corporal, it could not possibly have any connection with the body. For only matters can be touched or touch. He imagined the soul to be nothing more than a coat of matter thinly spread over the whole of the body, of which it constituted a part, as much connected with it as the foot, the hand, or the head. Hence, he concludes that it is destroyed by death, that it is dissipated like a vapor, and that it retains no consciousness or feeling any more than the body. That consequently, death is not to be feared, since it is no ill, either good or evil consisting entirely in consciousness. Death, therefore, being a privation of all consciousness, is a thing which in no way concerns us, since we can never have anything in common with it. As whilst we are, it is not, and when it is, we are not. When a man is in the world, it is indeed very natural for him to wish to remain, as long as he finds pleasure in it. But he ought to feel no more reluctance in leaving it than at rising from table after making a hearty dinner. He said that few people knew how to use life properly, that every man, despising the present moment, looked to some future good, whence he was to derive his happiness, and was generally surprised by death, before he had time to accomplish half his schemes, and that to this procrastination of felicity was owing to the misery of human life, that therefore nothing was more proper than to enjoy the present moment without anticipating the future, and that we ought not estimate the happiness of life by the number of years we may remain upon the earth, but solely by the enjoyments that may have fallen to our share. A short and agreeable life, said he, is much more desirable than a long and dull one. It is delicacies we look for at an elegant entertainment, and not for a great number of ill-dressed dishes. If we acknowledge that after death we shall forever be deprived of enjoyments, we must recollect also that we shall no longer entertain a desire to possess them, any more than we had before we were born. He deemed it a great weakness to be afraid of the representations that were made of the infernal regions, showing that the punishments of Tantalus, Sisyphus, Titurus, and the Danaids were ingenious allegories invented to exemplify the passions and anxieties with which men are tormented in this world, and that it was the business of a wise man to get rid of all such dreads which only served to disturb the enjoyment and tranquility of life. He made liberty to consist in complete indifference. He rejected fatalism and looked upon the art of divination as a frivolous thing, it being impossible to know future events, since they are regulated by human caprice and do not spring out of necessary causes. Epicurus always spoke in the sublimest terms of the divinity and wished everyone to entertain on that subject sentiments equally elevated as his own. He expressly forbade any of his disciples to attribute to the supreme being anything unworthy of immortality and perfect happiness, and remarked that the really impious man was not he who disbelieved in the gods, who were held in all adoration by the vulgar, but he who fell in all the errors respecting them that the vulgar entertained. He inculcated that our devotion was due to the divinity on account of his perfections, and that we ought to render it to him on that consideration alone, and not from fear of punishment or hope of reward. He blamed the superstitions which only served to abuse the credulity of the vulgar and were often made a cloak for the most iniquitous practices. The religion of his country did not consider the gods as exempt from human frailties, but he regarded them as happy beings, residing in delightful places where neither wind nor rain nor sorrow ever came and where air was always serene, the light always brilliant, and the consciousness of their own felicity was their sole and sufficient occupation. He believed them to be entirely free from everything that annoys and embarrasses mortals, and that, wholly independent of us for their happiness, they could not possibly be affected either by our good or bad actions, with which, indeed, he maintained they could not any way interfere without involving their own felicity. Hence, he deemed all invocations prayers, and sacrifices superfluous, and that there was nothing meritorious in having recourse to the gods, 
and prostrating ourselves before their altar, altars in all our emergencies, for that we ought to submit to everything which comes to pass with an equal and unruffled mind. He adds that men do not derive their ideas of the gods from reason, and that the fear, which seems intuitive in us of these tranquil beings, originates often in the mere phantoms of our own imagination, which presents gigantic and hideous forms to us in our dreams. Sometimes these forms appear to threaten us, in imperious and haughty tones suited to their majestic mien, we see them perform the most astonishing things, apparently at their pleasure. And as there is no place in which these phantoms do not appear, and as there are many wonderful effects of which the causes appear to be unknown, persons who are unenlightened, contemplating the sun, the moon, the stars, and the regularity of their movements, immediately imagine these nocturnal specters to be eternal and, om and omnipotent beings. They assign to them the middle of the firmament for their abode because it is from there that they see the thunder, lightning, rain, hail, and snow proceed. They make these beings preside over the conduct of this admirable machine of the world and attribute to them in general all the effects of which the causes lie hidden. Hence, says he, arise the immense number of altars that are to be found in all parts of the world, and he believes that the worship of which is offered up to the gods has no other origin than these groundless fears. Lucretius, agreeably to the doctrines of Epicurus, says, in speaking of the delightful dwelling of the gods, that we are not to suppose that there exists any resemblance between them and the palaces that we see on earth, that the gods, being of so fine a material that they do not come under the cognizance of our senses, and that we can scarcely even form any idea of them. The places which they inhabit must, of necessity, be proportioned to the subtlety of their nature. All philosophers agree that, according to the ordinary course of nature, nothing can be produced from nothing, and that not anything can be reduced to nothing. We are taught by experience that from the ruins of one body other bodies are produced, so that consequently they must have one common origin, and it is in this common origin that is called the primitive matter. Respecting this primitive matter, a variety of opinions have been entertained. Epicurus believed it to consist of atoms, that is to say, of small, invisible corpuscles of which he says all things are composed. Besides atoms, he emits another principle, namely a vacuum or void. He does not, however, consider it as a principle in the composition of bodies. He admits it only as a connected with motion. For, he says, if there were not a small empty space spread throughout nature, there would be no such thing as motion. The whole mass of matter would remain perpetually pressed together like a rock, and consequently would never be susceptible of any reproduction. He maintains that these atoms have existed for all eternity, that their forms, though finite, are varied to a degree which is beyond our comprehension, and that each distinct form is still a combination of an almost infinite number of atoms. He attributed their motion to their own weight, that they unite by the force of collision, that the various combinations in which they arrange themselves produce the various effects which we see in nature, that consequently all those effects were attributable to chance alone, which had caused the fortuitous assemblage of a certain number of atoms in a certain form. These atoms he compared to the letters of the alphabet, which form different words accordingly as they may be differently arranged. Thus, for instance, the words are and ear although composed of the same letters, are of quite different significations, that in consequence of their different arrangement, and in the same manner, atoms form very different bodies, according to the different forms and proportions in which they might be arranged. Nevertheless, he maintained that all sorts of atoms are not alike proper for the composition of all sorts of bodies. For instance, it appears highly probable that those atoms which compose a fleece of wool are not equally fit to compose a diamond, as we may see many words which are formed without one letter among them in common. He imagined these small bodies to be in perpetual motion, that therefore nothing in nature remained long in the same state, that some diminished whilst other augmented from the fragments of those that were thus diminished, some decayed while others acquired fresh vigor, Hence, that the duration of everything in the universe is only temporary. Yet, as in proportions that one body wastes, the atoms which are detached from it combine with others and form another body altogether different from that to which they had formerly belonged, so nothing can entirely perish, though the existence of all things in any given form be only temporary. 
and that though at last everything may seem to disappear, yet nothing can ever be utterly lost or annihilated. Epicurus supposed that there had been a period when all atoms were in a state of separation from each other, that by fortuitous combination they at length composed an infinite number of worlds, each of which will perish at the end of a finite period, either by fire, as if the sun were to approach so near the earth as to burn it up, or by some great and terrible shock which will instantaneously plunge everything into disorder and irretrievably destroy the machinery of the world. In short, that this variety of worlds may be made to perish in a variety of ways, but that from the wreck of each, others will be formed, which will immediately begin to produce new animals. It appears probable from this view of the subject that the very world which we inhabit is only a heap of ruins from some mighty and overwhelming destruction, in proof of which we have only to contemplate the dreadful gulfs which the sea presents, the lofty chain of mountains, and the long ledges of rocks, some of which lie horizontally, others rise perpendicularly, others are thrown across. Witness also the inequalities even in the bowels of the earth, the subterranean rivers, lakes, and caverns which they contain, and also the still greater inequalities to be found on its face, intersected as it is with seas, lakes, straits, islands, and mountains. Epicurus supposes the universe to be infinite, that this grand whole has neither center nor boundaries, and that from whatever imaginary point we may diverge, there is an infinite space to traverse, of which it is impossible ever to arrive at the end. He considered it mere weakness and vanity to imagine that the gods had framed this world for the sake of the human race. It is not very likely, said he, that after remaining so long in a state of tranquility, they should think of changing their original mode of life for a different one. It is moreover fair to infer, by the imperfections which may be discovered in it, that this world cannot be the production of the gods. End of section 29. Section 30 of the Lives of the Ancient Philosophers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lives of the Ancient Philosophers by Francois Fenelon. Section 30. Epicurus, Part 2. He believed that man and all other animals originally came out of the earth in the same manner as we see it teeming with rats, moles, and insects of every species. He supposes the earth in its primitive state to have been fat and nitrous, that being gradually heated by the sun, it put forth herbage and shrubs, and began to throw up on its surface a great number of small tumors in the same way that mushrooms spring up that these tumors came to maturity the skin swelled and broke and gave liberty to a little animal which creeping out from the moisture that had generated it began to respire and that as soon as these little animals were thus born there issued from the same tumors that had served them as their wombs streams of milk wherewith to nourish them among the vast numbers of animals thus brought forth many monsters were to be found some without heads others without feet some without mouths others mere trunks so that some were unable to take nourishment and others to propagate their species hence there only remained such as were perfectly organized and from them we derived all the different species of animal life which we find now existing the earth in its primitive state was not according to epicurus subjected to such extremes of heat and cold and vicissitudes of the seasons as at present all things were then in their infancy the race of men newly sprung from the earth were much more robust than we are their bodies were covered with shaggy hair like the bears they neither required nor knew the use of garments and the coarsest food sufficed to nourish them wherever night happened to come upon them there they threw themselves naked on the earth to sleep and if it chanced to rain they crept beneath the bushes for shelter they had not yet begun to congregate together every one thought only of himself and laboured only for his individual wants 
among other productions of the earth were trees which increasing every day had formed vast forests men therefore began to live upon acorns wild apples and the fruits of the arbutus in procuring these they were often exposed to rencontres with bears and lions and they began to go in parties in order that they might be better enabled to defend themselves from these ferocious animals they next raised small huts occupied themselves in the chase and contrived to make themselves garments from the skins of the animals they killed they chose wives for themselves and each lived in his own hut with the woman that he selected from the intercourse between these pairs arose children who softened by their infantine endearments the ferocious humour of their father such was the origin of society neighborhood begot friendship and injuries were mutually avoided at first signs were only made use of to satisfy wants but afterwards they found it more convenient to invent certain names which they bestowed at random upon objects and gradually proceeded from them to form a jargon which they made use of as a vehicle for the interchange of their thoughts the use of fire was discovered to them by the sun without farther contrivance they at first basked in its rays the meats which they procured in the chase but one day a flash of lightning chanced to fall upon a heap of combustible matter and set it on a blaze in a moment the men who already knew the value of fire instead of extinguishing it endeavoured carefully to preserve it and every one carried a portion of it to his own hut and used it to dress his victuals after this towns were built and lands divided the shares were not however parcelled out with impartiality the strongest and most cunning helped themselves to the best portions constituted themselves kings forced others to obey them and built citadels to avoid being subjugated in their turns by their neighbours in those days men had no other weapons of defence than their hands nails and teeth or sticks and stones such were the arms with which they settled their disputes being induced for some cause or other to set fire to forests they discovered veins of metal which being melted by the heat ran along the little cracks in the earth delighted with its brilliancy they imagined seeing that it was capable of being liquefied by fire that they might mould it into any form they wished at first they only thought of applying it to arms they therefore esteemed copper much more highly than gold finding that weapons of gold would not take by any means so sharp an edge as those of copper they afterwards made use of this metal likewise for bits ploughshares and in short for everything else that it was fit for before the invention of iron clothes were made of various materials knit together but as soon as it was found that this metal could be made subservient to all the purposes of life means were devised for weaving stuffs and linens for the increased convenience of the human race for the art of sewing they were indebted to nature herself from the beginning of the world it had been evident that the acorns which fell from oaks produced other trees exactly like the oaks themselves accordingly men when they were desirous of having oaks grow in any particular spot planted acorns and as the same result was produced from the same cause with respect to other plants individuals each sowed that grain of which he had most need the next observation that presented itself was that in every species whatsoever the increase depended greatly on the degree of cultivation which the soil received and hence the attention of the community was quickly turned to agriculture until this period strength and address had sufficed to maintain superiority but no sooner had gold made its appearance and mankind suffered themselves to be dazzled by its brilliancy then every one sought to hoard it up for himself some enriched themselves greatly by this means and their first sovereigns who had no other merit than their strength and cunning attached themselves solely to those who had wealth the kings were massacred and the government descended into the hands of the people 
laws were framed and magistrates appointed to enforce obedience to them and to regulate public business in proportion as mankind thus departed from their original ferocity they began to cultivate the pleasures of society and to make entertainments for each other at which after having eaten and drunk of the best fare they had to offer they solaced themselves with listening to the warblings of the bird and afterwards endeavoured to imitate them and compose songs which they sung to the same notes that they had learned from the birds the soothing murmur of the winds as they passed over the brooks suggested to them the invention of flutes and the admiration with which they gazed on the celestial bodies induced them to turn their attention to astronomy avarice likewise began to exert its influence over their actions they made war upon each other for the purpose of dispossessing others of their property this afforded excitement to poets to describe the valiant exploits that took place in these engagements and for painters to represent them and the tranquillity and abundant leisure which they possessed in the intervals of peace that succeeded these wars afforded them the opportunity of perfecting themselves in the arts originally suggested to them by necessity and even to invent new ones to increase the conveniences of life to the objection which was opposed to this theory of epicurus that the earth no longer brought forth men lions dogs or other animals he replied that the fecundity of the earth was exhausted by age as a woman advanced in years no longer bears children that lands newly cultivated produce much greater crops the first years than in succeeding ones that when a forest is cut down the same ground no longer furnishes such trees as have been rooted up but only a degenerate and dwarfish race such as thorns briars and other underwood he argues moreover that there may be even at the present time rabbits hares foxes bears and other animals brought forth in a perfect state by the earth alone but that such events occurring only in solitary places where we cannot have evidence of the fact we are unwilling to admit it any more than that of rats being produced out of the earth because we ourselves have never seen any other than what we have produced by other rats philosophers are divided in their opinion as to what ought to be considered as the test of truth epicurus maintains that there is no other criterion of it than that which is afforded us by our senses and that it is by relation to them alone that we can distinguish things that are true from those that are false respecting the understanding he maintained that in its primitive state it resembles a blank sheet of paper being devoid of any idea or impression whatsoever that when the corporeal organs are fully formed it gradually receives knowledge through the medium of the senses that it becomes enabled to think on things absent and thus is liable to deceive itself by taking for present that which is absent and even occasionally that which does not exist at all that in judging by the senses on the contrary we can never be deceived as by them we can only perceive objects which are actually present and consequently can never be mistaken as to the reality of their existence none but a madman therefore says epicurus will be satisfied with arguments of reasons independent of the concurrence of his senses the nature of vision has been explained by philosophers in a variety of ways epicurus imagined that from all bodies a number of their aerial forms were perpetually flying off exactly resembling the bodies from which they were thus detached that the air was free of these fine subtle forms and that it was by means of them that we were enabled to form our perceptions of external things he held that scent heat sound light and other sensible qualities are not simple perceptions of the mind but positive and eternal as they seem and that a certain quantity of matter agitated in a certain manner continually constituted scent 
sound light heat and other sensible qualities independent of any sentient being that for example in a flower garden small particles are perpetually detaching themselves from the flowers and fill the air all around with delicious odors similar to what we ourselves should perceive were we walking in the garden and in the same manner when a bell rings the surrounding atmosphere is filled with sharp tremulous sounds such as vibrate in our ears on hearing it that as soon as the sun begins to appear the air is filled with brilliant appearances like the light which shines upon our eyes and that when the same thing appears different to two different animals it is because these animals differ from each other in their internal organization that for instance the reason why the leaves of the willow appear bitter to man and sweet to the goat is that goats and men are not constructed in the same manner internally the stoics who notwithstanding the severity of their professions were vain to an excess were extremely jealous of the number of friends and followers that attached themselves to epicurus whose philosophy was moreover very different from that of the stoic school they not only tried by every means in their power to decoy him but even propagated many infamous calumnies of him in their writings hence it is that posterity who have chiefly known epicurus through the representation of the stoics have suffered themselves to be deceived into the idea that he was a man of debauched habits whereas he was exemplary for the purity consistency and moderation of his conduct in every respect an honourable testimony in favour of his chastity is borne to him by saint gregory epicurus says this father of the church defines the object of human existence to be enjoyment but lest any one might imagine that it could be sensual pleasure which he meant he set an example in his own life of unimpeachable chastity and uniform temperance confirming the sincerity of his precepts by the purity of his practice epicurus always declined taking any part in the government of the republic preferring a life of leisure and tranquillity to the anxiety of state affairs the statues publicly erected to him by the athenians sufficiently testify the esteem in which he was held those who once attached themselves to him never left him with the exception of metrodorus who quitted him to study in the academy under carneades but returned at the end of six months and remained with him until his own death which took place a short time before that of epicurus the reputation of the school of epicurus always maintained its original splendor and when all other systems were almost abandoned his was held in unabated esteem he was still teaching at athens when he was taken ill in that city of a retention of urine which was a source of the most exquisite sufferings to him perceiving that his existence was drawing to its close he affranchised a number of his slaves disposed of his effects and ordered that his own birthday and that of each of his parents should be annually solemnized about the tenth day of the month gamelion or january he bequeathed his garden and his books to hermicus of mytilene who succeeded to him on condition that they should descend in succession to all those who might in future fill the same place he wrote to idomeneus as follows thanks to the gods i am at length arrived at the last and happiest days of my life i am so tormented by the violence of my disease so racked with pains in the bladder and intestines that it is impossible to imagine a state of greater torture in the midst of all my sufferings however i find consolation in the retrospect of my life and the thought that to me philosophy is indebted for many of its soundest arguments i conjure you by the attachment you have always evinced for me and for my doctrines to take care of the children of metrodorus a fortnight after the commencement of his attack epicurus went into a warm bath prepared expressly for him 
as soon as he entered he asked for a glass of pine wine and having drunk it expired immediately afterwards in the very act of exhorting his friends and disciples who were standing around him to bear him and the precepts he had given them in their remembrance the athenians testified the most lively grief at his death which took place in the hundred and twenty-seventh olympiad End of section 30Section 31 of Lives of the Ancient Philosophers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Lives of the Ancient Philosophers by Francois Fenelon. Zeno. Zeno died in the 129th Olympiad. Zeno the founder of the sect of the Stoics, was a native of Citium in the Isle of Cyprus. In order to determine what course of life he should pursue, his first care was to consult the oracle, to learn of it what plan he should adopt to become happy. The oracle replied that it was necessary for him to assume the colour of the dead. Zeno concluded that it was the hidden meaning of the divinity that he should devote himself to the study of the writings of the ancients, and reflecting seriously upon it, he began, with great assiduity, to apply himself to the reading and understanding of them, and to follow to the utmost of his ability the advice of the oracle. One day, in returning from Phoenicia, where he had been to buy purple, he was shipwrecked in the Piraeus. The loss he sustained on the occasion rendered him unhappy and dejected. He returned to Athens, and, calling at a bookseller's for some work that might tend to console him, began to read the second book of Xenophon, in which he shortly found such great delight that his grief was entirely banished from his mind. He inquired of the bookseller where such men were to be found, as Xenophon described in his work. See, said the bookseller, pointing with his finger to Crates the Cynic, who chanced at that moment to be passing by. There is such a one as you seek. Follow him. Zeno immediately followed Crates, and from that very day became his disciple at which period he was about thirty years of age. Zeno had a great deal of modesty and reserve, and could not reconcile himself to the bold effrontery of the cynics. Crates perceived that he was uneasy on the subject, and was desirous to cure him of his weakness. He one day gave him a pot full of lentils, and desired him to go with it through that part of the city called Ceramicus. Zeno coloured with confusion, and endeavoured to conceal his features that he might not attract observation. Foolish fellow, said Crates, why are you ashamed, since you have committed no offence? Philosophy had many charms for Zeno, and he frequently praised fortune for the entire wreck of his property, lauding the kindness of those storms that had turned his mind from worldly possessions. He studied above ten years under Crates, without ever being able to acquire the licentious freedom of the cynics. At length he became desirous to quit his old master, to study under Stilpo of Magara. But Crates laid hold of his cloak, and endeavoured to retain him by force. Oh, Crates, said Zeno, a philosopher ought to be detained by the ears alone. You must convince me by sound arguments that your doctrines are superior to those of Stilpo, for if you are unable to do so, though you may by force compel me to remain with you, my body only will be yours, my mind will be altogether in the possession of Stilpo. Zeno passed the next ten years in the school of Stilpo, Xenocrates, and Polemo, after which period he withdrew himself from them, and established a new sect. His reputation quickly spread throughout Greece, and in a short time he became the most distinguished philosopher of the whole country. People came to him from all parts and were eager to become his disciples. And as he generally taught beneath a porch or gallery, his followers have received the appellation of Stoics. The Athenians honoured Zeno so highly that they confided to him the care of the keys of the city. They caused his statue to be erected, and presented him with a crown of gold. Antigonus the king could never sufficiently express his admiration of this philosopher, and never came to Athens without attending his discourses. Frequently he went home to sup with him, 
or took him to the house of Aristocles, the player on the harp. But Zeno gradually avoided all feasts and public entertainments, under the apprehension of becoming too familiar and convivial. Antigonus used all his influence to attach him to his person, but Zeno declined leaving Athens, and sent in his stead Perseus and Philonides, with the assurance that he experienced considerable gratification at the desire the king manifested for knowledge, and that nothing was more effectual than the love of philosophy in separating the mind from sensuality, and directing it towards virtue. Indeed, added he, did not my age and impaired state of health prevent my undertaking a journey, I should not have hesitated to accompany you. But since it cannot be so, I send you two of my friends, equal to myself in ability and learning, and far more robust, and more capable of fatigue. If you converse seriously with them, and diligently attend to their precepts, you will soon discover that nothing will be wanting to your means of attaining the chief good. Zeno was tall, thin, and of a dark complexion, for which reason he was by some of his followers surnamed the Palm Tree of Egypt. His head inclined towards one side, and his legs were large and had the appearance of disease. His dress always consisted of a thin stuff, the cheapest that could be procured. His invariable rule in diet was to restrict himself to the use of bread, figs, honey, and sweet wine, never taking any article that required cookery. His countenance was so rigid that it was usual in praising any one for this virtue to say he is more chaste than Zeno. Though of a grave deportment, his wit was lively, and his humour caustic and severe, and in delivering it he usually knit his brow and compressed his lips. Nevertheless, in agreeable company he was gay, and the delight of the whole assembly. If any one asked the reason of so extraordinary a change, lupins, he replied, are naturally bitter, but when they have been steeped for some time in water, they become mild and sweet. In his discourse he was extremely concise, and gave as a reason for it his conviction that the speech of a wise man ought to be as brief as possible. When he reprimanded any one, he never used many words, and those were always indirectly applied. One day a young man pressed him with much earnestness for information on a subject that was beyond his capacity to understand. Zeno called for a mirror, and placing it before the youth, Look, said he, how do these sage questions and that face of inexperience agree together? The feeble harangues of certain orators he compared to the coin of Alexandria, which though splendid in appearance, was made of worthless metal. With respect to the education of youth, he was accustomed to say that the greatest injury they could suffer was to be brought up in the principles of vanity, that they ought to be instructed in the rules of civility, and to do nothing out of proper time or season. Cephesius, added he, seeing one of his pupils inflated with pride, gave him a box on the ear, saying, Were you elevated to a station above other men, that circumstance alone would never constitute you a man of worth. But by becoming a man of worth, you would, in consequence, become raised above the level of other men. On being asked what a friend was, it is another self, he replied. Being present one day at an entertainment given to the ambassadors of Ptolemy, he spoke not a word during the whole repast. The ambassadors were surprised, and asked him if he had nothing to communicate to the king, their master. Tell him, replied he, that you have seen a man who knows how to be silent. The Stoics contended that the proposed object of life should be to live agreeably to nature, and that to live according to nature is never to act in opposition to the suggestion of reason, which is a universal law to be observed by all men alike. They taught that virtue should be followed for its own sake alone, without any expectation of reward, that in itself it was sufficient to render men happy, and that they who possessed it would enjoy perfect contentment, even in the midst of the greatest evils. They maintained that only what was good could be useful, and that what was criminal could never lead to utility. Sensual enjoyments, they observed, could not be estimated as a good, because they were dishonourable and nothing dishonourable could be regarded as good. A wise man, said they, is a stranger to fear. Neither has he pride, since glory and infamy are alike indifferent to him. The character of the wise man is compounded of severity and sincerity. He is not prohibited the moderate use of wine, but inebriety he must strictly avoid. 
that he may not lose, even for a single moment in his whole life, the exercise of his reason. He ought to have a deep reverence for the gods, to offer them sacrifice, and to shun all degrees of intemperance. They maintained that only the wise man is capable of friendship, that he ought to take his share in the affairs of the Republic, in order to prevent vice, and to excite the citizens to virtue, that only such as himself ought to be entrusted with the government of the state, since it was only persons of his description who could decide respecting what was really right or wrong, that no others could be in themselves irreproachable and incapable of committing an injury against any one, and that they alone were exempt from that vulgar admiration which dazzles and bewilders the perceptions of common people. They held that the virtues were so closely connected with each other that it was impossible to possess one without possessing all, that there is no medium between virtue and vice, for, said they, as it is absolutely necessary that a thing must be right or wrong, so every action must be good or bad. Zeno lived to the age of ninety-eight years, without ever having experienced the least sickness. He was greatly regretted after his death. When King Antigonus heard of the event, he was much affected by it. Ye gods, said he, what a treasure I have lost. He was asked why he esteemed this philosopher so highly. It is, said he, because not all the valuable presents I made him could ever tempt him to commit a mean action. He immediately sent a deputation to Athens to request them to suffer Zeno to be buried in the Ceramicus. The Athenians, on their part, were not less sensible of the loss of Zeno than Antigonus was. The chief magistrates made a public eulogy on him after his death, and in order to render it still more authentic, issued a public decree in the following terms. Decree Whereas Zeno, the son of Menasius of Citium, having passed many years teaching philosophy in this city, proving himself in all things a man of extraordinary merit, and constantly directing the youth under his care to the pursuits of virtue, always himself leading a life conformable to the doctrines he taught, the people deem it proper that he should be publicly eulogized, and presented with a crown of gold, which he hath justly merited on account of his perfect integrity and temperance, and to erect a monument to him in the Ceramicus at the public expense. The people decree also that five persons shall be chosen in Athens, to whom the superintendence of the making of the crown and the building of the monument shall be entrusted. Also that the Secretary of the Republic shall cause the present decree to be engraved on two columns, one of which shall be placed in the Academy, and the other in the Lyceum, and that the money necessary for this undertaking shall be immediately lodged in the hands of the persons who have the direction of public business, in order that it may be made known throughout the world that the Athenians reverence the good as much after their death as during their lives. This decree was issued some days after the death of Zeno, when Archimedes was Archon. Zeno's death was occasioned by the circumstance of his breaking his finger by accidentally striking against some object as he was coming out of his school. Regarding this as a warning from the gods that his death was about to take place, he instantly struck the earth with his hand, and exclaiming, Dost thou demand me? I am ready. He, instead of endeavouring to heal his finger, coolly put an end to his existence by strangling himself. He had spent sixty-three years in the study of philosophy, from the time of first applying himself to it under Crates the Cynic, and forty-eight years of that period he had himself taught publicly, without any intermission. The End End of section 31 End of Lives of the Ancient Philosophers by Francois Fenelon